welcome. Okay, let me do a little bit better. Maybe we'll start local with some welcome. Turn to your neighbor and just tell them peace and love. Okay, see, that, that, that didn't hurt you, did it? And you're still in one piece. Peace, you get it? Still in one piece? Okay. But today I am fortunate to welcome you and to have you be a part of what we've called the 21 Days of Peace here at Emory. Now, some people may be looking and say, well, this is the 22nd day. Uh, but we thought it was so good we should add an extra day to it. Uh, but the reality is, is that we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to be sensitive and recognize all the different parts of our Emory community. And we know Rosh Hashanah was, was taking place during this time, and we thought it was important to acknowledge that. And so that was, was part of the, the, the reason and rationale that we moved to having 22 days of peace. And uh, we are live in a world and live in a time where there's so much going on, I think everyone would be safe to say that we can have and should have more peace in the world. And uh, we're so fortunate today to have just a great conversation we we're anticipating having. And uh, I just want to just let you know that, that all of this was put together by, an, by a lot of time and effort, but it was put together in love. And so my name is James Rowland. Uh, I have the fortunate pleasure of working in campus life uh, I'm the director of civic and community engagement, the office that we have in Campus Life. Uh, got some other titles attached to that, but really our office is committed to making sure that individuals across the Emory community have a meaningful engagement in the community and as well as here on campus. And so uh, I am happy to bring you the welcome today for this event. Uh, I also have had the, through over the past year the distinct pleasure and privilege of serving as the co-chair of the Emory 21 Days of Peace and I am thus especially honored to welcome you to our 21 Day Peace finale event on today. The Emory 21 Days of Peace is presented by the Emory Institute for Developing Nations in partnership with Campus Life and in collaboration with the Carter Center Human Rights Program and the United States Institute of Peace. The goal of Emory's 21 Days of Peace is to educate, to inspire, and to empower the students in the Emory community with tangible skills to work for peace both in their local and their global communities. Today's event will be streamed live, so make sure you put on your good side, okay? Okay. Will be streamed live by the Carter Center's Human Rights Program, and so we are glad that they have been fortunate enough to come on our campus and, and televise and record this event. You can also tweet since we know some people in our society like to tweet a lot. You can also <laughs> tweet. You can also tweet as well and post using hashtag Emory 21 Days of Peace and hashtag Peace Day Challenge. And you can also let your presence be known about the meaningful work and uh, things that we're doing here at Emory. I would like to take a moment also to acknowledge all of the, com the committee members of Emory's 21 Days of Peace who put in a lot of work and contributed to Emory 21 Days of Peace with such enthusiasm. Could you give them a big round of applause? <laughs> One of the special aspects of this initiative is having the opportunity to work across the various units of the university with students, faculty, and staff in fostering collaborations across the university. So this is a very unique opportunity. Oftentimes we work in our silos, everyone's doing some amazing work, but when you have an opportunity to, to go across campus and make uh, connections with individuals that are like-minded and see the mission and the importance of an event like this, it really makes it unique and special. And we would also like today to take a moment to announce that today's event is presented in part with the support of two student organizations. We really like them because they provided the food that you're eating. So you should really give them some special thanks as you sit there and mmm, yeah, okay, I, I see all of the nonverbal communication uh, that's taking place. The Refugee Revive and the Bread Coffee House uh, were our two student sponsors today. And the Refugee Revive seeks to facilitate transitioning of refugees through advising on employment and education resources. And Refugee Revive works with refugees from the Syrian uh, Committee who have prepared today's lunch for us. Could we give them a big round of applause?
and the Bread Coffee House is a free coffee house and campus ministry to students, and they have provided the coffee for this event. So let's give them a round of applause as well. <laughs> and we would like to also, at this time, uh, welcome one of our awesome and amazing, I can't say enough about this student leader from the very first time that I had a chance to meet her. She has had a profound and positive impact on the Emory community. You should get her autograph the day before she leaves because she's going to be super famous one day. Uh, but she is the executive director, so she got a fancy title too. You know when they give you fancy titles, you got to be real important. Uh, she's also the executive director for Volunteer Emory. And they do a tremendous amount of work uh, in the community and also here on campus to try to help us understand the importance of giving back. Without any further ado, if you give a big round of applause to Blair Eli, Executive Director of Volunteer Emory. Wow, I definitely do not deserve that introduction, but thank you so much. I'm, I'm really honored to be here today and I'm really excited to represent Volunteer Emory um, and our support of the Emory 21 Days of Peace. Um, and I'm excited about its future and all of the resources that it's making available to our student body and our world. We're looking forward to growing this program and beginning and being even more involved in years to come. And I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce Dean Ajay Nair today, who will be making some brief remarks. Dr. Nair is the Senior Vice President and Dean of Campus Life at Emory and is an accomplished scholar and student affairs leader whose interests include immigration, race, and ethnicity. As Emory's chief student advocate for nearly 13,000 undergraduate and graduate students, Dean Nair shoulders a broad portfolio of responsibilities ranging from intercollegiate athletics and the Greek experience to student health services and residence life. He also provides leadership and strategic direction in cultivating an ethically engaged community consistent with Emory's vision. Previously, Dr. Nair served as Senior Associate Vice Provost for Student Affairs at the University of Pennsylvania, and he had also held positions at Columbia University, Penn State University, and the University of Virginia. We're lucky to have him. During his tenure in higher education, he has served in a variety of capacities as faculty member, student affairs administrator, and academic administrator. Dean Nair serves as the, on the NASP, NASPA Student Affairs Administrators and Higher Education Board as director of the Division of Equity, Inclusion, and Social Justice. His research interests include quality assurance in educational systems, service learning and civic engagement, and second generation Asian American identity. His co-edited book, Desi Rap, Hip Hop in South Asian America, focuses on the complexities of second generation South Asian American identity. His current book project explores the current state of multiculturalism in higher education. So without further ado, Dr. Nair, thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon. Excellent. So I just uh, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm afraid that introduction is going to be longer than my actual welcome to all of you, <laughs> but I appreciate it. And, and James, you should know I've already tweeted, but I've done it responsibly. Okay. <laughs> that was not any social commentary there. <laughs> but I also want to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues, particularly the Institute for Developing Nations, for helping to organize this program, this very powerful program, and also a special thanks to the Carter Center's Human Rights Program and the United States Institute of Peace. Um, I also want to note, as James mentioned, this is a huge organizing committee, something like 25 people. It may be the biggest organizing committee ever on Emory's campus, but I should add, not just the biggest, but also most effective, correct? <laughs> yes, so can we give them another round of applause, please? With the national undercurrent of hate, violence, divisive rhetoric, this work is needed now more than ever before, undoubtedly. Like many of you, I feel anger more than I ever have before in my life. Anger about policies, anger about words, anger with action that I see happening around me, and this anger is a terrible, terrible place to be. It's destructive, it's painful, it's toxic. 
But events like this, events just like this, are awesome reminders that our anger can be tempered by the desire that we have to pursue justice. And the concept of peace reminds us that we must pursue justice justly, because not doing so may compromise the very justice that we seek. For campus life, this is a natural partnership. We have worked hard to become a justice-centered organization, an organization that enables positive transformation among our community members, in their community, and in the world. Let me just conclude by expressing my gratitude to all of you for your passion, your dedication, your commitment to this important work around peace and justice. As you know, peace is not merely about endings, it's also about beginnings. As a community, let's share in this beginning, in this powerful, powerful program, to galvanize our community against hate and injustice, and to transform ourselves and the community around us. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dean Nair. Uh, it is my honor now to introduce the one, the only, the amazing Dabney Evans. Uh, Ms. Dabney Evans is an assistant professor of global health at the Hubert Department of Health in the Rollins School of Public Health. It's a lot of public health there. Uh, and the interim director of the Institute for Developing Nations at Emory University. She's a mixed method researcher working at the intersection of global public health and human rights. As one of the first faculty to include health and human rights in the public health curriculum, Dr. Evans is an established teacher and trainer. Since 2010, her teachings and her training activities have touched over 19,000, let me say that again, 19,000 learners from 171 countries. I'm just still trying to get to 17, so 171 countries, that's amazing. Dr. Evans, current research projects focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights, and particularly the relationship between anti-femicide legislation and perceptions of intimate partner violence in Brazil. Dr. Evans has published over 30 book chapters, scholarly articles, and commissioned works. She has made over 100 peer-reviewed and invited presentations. And in 2017, she was named the recipient of the American Public Health Association mid-career, mid-career, I would say mid-career award in international health. Could you please give a warm uh, reception to the one and only Ms. Dabney Evans. Thank you for saying mid-career like that, because uh, usually I feel like it's like mid-career, you know? Um, thank you so much. James mentioned my work in Brazil, and um, I just flew overnight on a red-eye flight from a, a conference on sexual violence that I've been at for the past week. And um, thinking about coming here today, you know, what I realized, as Dean Iyer was saying, we are living in such fraught times, such violent times, really. All of us are at war. And to fly overnight and come today to a celebration of peace is really, really important. So yesterday, uh, as I was preparing to leave, uh, you'll feel real sorry for me, I was in Rio. <laughs> and, um, but I was driving in a car, and I saw a very large group of people on the beach. And I said, what's going on? I asked my, my taxi driver, what's going on? Is it a wedding? What is it? And we realized that it was a celebration of Rosh Hashanah. Because in Brazil, in the new year, you go to the ocean and you make your wishes for the new year. So it reminded me, even in that space of, of hearing and talking about violence the whole week long, that peace is everywhere and that every day gives us a new opportunity for peace. So I'm really, really happy to be here today. And again, you've heard about the support of so many different organizations across our campus that have been involved, over 25 organizations that have been involved in this. But I want to give a shout out to Obse and James, who have been the co-chairs and have coordinated and collaborated and convened 
all these many actors together. So please join me in thanking them for their work. At IDN, we are absolutely um, delighted to sponsor and participate in this event in collaboration with our partners from Campus Life and the Human Rights Program at the Carter Center. And our goal, which you already heard about, is to empower, educate, and inspire students committed to building peace locally and globally. So as a teacher, that's our learning objective. And what I expect of you when you walk out of this room today is to feel inspired and motivated for action. This initiative, 21 Days for Peace, has allowed us to work across various university entities and convene over 25 committee members. And I really, really appreciate their work and I'm so glad. But more importantly, I am so glad to see all of you as peace builders in this room. So thank you for being here. Creating this kind of opportunity for students is one of our major roles and responsibilities on campus. As you may know, IDN was started in 2003 by President Carter, and he's no slouch when it comes to peace, and former Emory University President Jim Wagner to engage students in problem solving, to, say, to face some of the most complex challenges facing our world now more than ever. So working in partnerships with colleagues and the programs of the Carter Center, we bridge the gap between scholarship and practice. We are enthusiastic and committed to growing Emory 21 Days of Peace, and we hope you will join us in that, and to continue to provide students with the resources that will lead them to change the world for better. We hope you join us in that too. So today's program is going to consist of a short video followed by a conversation with our guest speaker on building peace locally and globally. Once I introduce our keynote speaker, she will make her remarks, and we will be joined by student and peace advocates for a conversation, who, and the students will begin by introducing themselves. So I am pleased and honored to introduce Emory 21 Days of Peace keynote speaker, Marguerite Barenkitze. Marguerite, or Maggie, was born in 1957 in Ruyuji, East Burundi, one of the poorest regions of the country. She was a teacher at a local secondary school, but was fired because of her protests against discrimination in the field of education between two ethnic groups, Hutus and Tutsis. Maggie put her dream of ethnic harmony into practice by adopting seven children, four Hutus and three Tutsis. As violence escalated between Hutus and Tutsis following the assassination of the first democratically elected president of Burundi, a group of armed Tutsis descended on Ruyugi on October 23, 1993, to kill the Hutu families who were hiding in the Bishop's Manor. Maggie managed to hide many of the children, but was caught by the fighters. They beat and humiliated her and forced her to watch the killing of 72 Hutus. But she refused to divulge where the children were hidden. Ultimately, she was only spared because she is a Tutsi. She decided to create a small nonprofit organization, Maison Shalom, the House of Peace. Maggie's open house is open to children of all ethnic origins, Tutsi, Hutu, and Twa. She calls them my Hutsi, Hutsiwa, Hutsi Twa. Thank you. Children and they call her Oma, or grandmother. Years later, in April 2015, when Maggie spoke out against the third term of Pierre Inzurun Ziza, she was obliged to hide for a month in the embassy in Burundi. Finally, she had to flee, being targeted on a government list for killing. She found herself a refugee. But her refugee status did not stop her devotion to alleviating suffering. She's now opened a branch of Maison Shalom in R Rwanda, where she sought refuge. Her vision to instill dignity in refugees and allow them to keep their dreams alive. She envisions that these refugees will go back home to be nurses, doctors, engineers, and well-educated people who will rebuild their country. Her motto is, we stay standing. Nous restons debout. 
She has been celebrated worldwide and has been recognized by earning multiple international prizes and awards. So we are so grateful to Maggie for joining us and leading us in this conversation today on peace. At a mass grave in eastern Burundi, Maggie Barankitsi remembers the unthinkable. It happened in 1993 at the Catholic bishop's residence where she worked. It's very hot. As ethnic violence exploded across the country, men with machetes invaded and unleashed a nightmare, separating ethnic Hutu people from ethnic Tutsis. They took off my clothes and then they tied me and they said, your punishment, that you keep silence. We will kill them in front of you. They began to kill priests, nuns, all the, the Hutu they know. When the bloodbath was over, 72 people were dead. And I stay alone among those bodies. I don't want to go. Over the following days, she risked her life to bury the victims. It, you can't imagine, I don't, 15 years after, I still wondering why, why? What do you do after something so horrific? For Maggie, the answer was extraordinary. I am Christian and I know that our human vocation is to love. I will try to, to make new generation Hutu and Tutsi together. As a war unfolded that would last 12 years and take 300,000 lives, she gathered orphans, dozens at first, then hundreds, then thousands as her own. I took those children with confidence because I believe that God is God. He will help me. Maggie established Maison Shalom, the house of peace, to restore these children. Her belief was that they needed education and love. And despite all they'd lost, a real home. So her children live not in orphanages, but in houses, caring for each other in small groups, living as a family. They have a future because it's their home. They have, when they leave school, they said, we go home. Throughout the war, they lived as a testament to peace. Maggie's children work together in businesses they own and run, including a salon, a tailor and seamstress shop, a mechanic school called the Garage of Angels, where former child soldiers, street children, and war orphans learn a skill and earn a living. Even their teacher is a child of Maison Shalom. I can't imagine what I would have become because of the war, but everything I am now is thanks to Maison Shalom. Over the years, Maggie added a library, language classes, computer lessons, and to prove to the children they deserved more than just survival, she built them a cinema and opened a swimming pool. Shalom was born to say no to the war, to say yes to the love, yes to the life. With Maggie, Maison Shalom is open to everyone so that healing, even in unspeakable circumstances, can truly take place. Aline's family was killed in the war, when she was only five, rebel soldiers attacked her with machetes and rocks and left her for dead. Maggie raised Aline, helped her start a business, and nurtured her spirit with the lessons of Maison Shalom. I can forgive because I was raised with so much love. God forgives my sins, so how can I not forgive those who hurt me? Reconciliation and forgiveness run deep at Maison Shalom, a place where Albert, a Hutu, and Mediatrice, a Tutsi, can grow up as brother and sister. God created us to be equal. 
and not to be separated by ethnicity. So at Maison Shalom, we all live as children of God. One of Maggie's biggest dreams is just now coming true, a new hospital open to all regardless of their ability to pay. There will be fewer orphans, she says, and a brighter future if mothers are cared for right now. New operating rooms are under construction. A nursing school is almost finished. Ambulance service is available for the first time ever. Maggie encourages all, including mothers living with HIV, to stand up, work hard, and support one another. I believe in this dignity that God gives us. We want peace. We want love. We believe in that. Maggie says love has made her an inventor, so she's never married, never confined herself to traditional limits. Woman must stay home, behind, not in front. And Maggie going in front. <laughs> I pray for Maggie, and I thank God for her. I wish we had mamas like Maggie all over Burundi. <laughs> Most people in Burundi live on less than a single dollar a day. But Maggie insists it is not a poor country, but rich with promise. Her life is God's, she says. Her work has touched more than 30,000 children. They rebuilt my heart. They give me hope. She is the living proof of what one person of faith can do to bring peace and hope to the world. I know that Eva will never take the last word. Never, never. A new generation is coming. I am not a dreamer. No, no, it's real. We, we are one family, one human family. <laughs> Thanks everyone so much for showing up today. This is uh, a magnanimous opportunity to be able to speak with Maggie and uh, sit in front of you all in such just a graceful presence. Uh, we had an opportunity to talk a little bit earlier before we got started and the level of comfort that Maggie exudes just has kind of washed over us. So I'm very thankful for you and for your, for your will and for God, following God's will. Uh, to get us started, we're going to start with just a few introductions. My name is Kevin Crawford. I'm the assistant chaplain here at Emory University. Our work is inherently uh, in religion and spirituality and about creating relationships through difference uh, rather than trying to just stay in the comfortable area of common ground and similarities. And so uh, the work that you have done with uh, all of these wonderful children are, are an inspiration or is an inspiration to our work as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Aga Hozo Sandrine Hunzimana, and I'm currently interning at the Carter Center in the Human Rights Program. And I'm very excited to meet you today because um, a lot of the work that we do is actually within the African continent, um, specifically West Africa. We actually just finished a project with um, working with girls in Ghana um, called Mobilizing Faith and Initiative. And right now we're working on a Christian annotated Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Hi everyone, my name is Farah Alchamas. I'm a junior double majoring in anthropology and interdisciplinary studies, and I'm here on behalf of Refugee Revive. I really wanna give a huge thank you to Malik, Majida, Nahla, and Hani for coming here and give us such deli delicious food. Please thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, Marguerite, it's such yeah, a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> so. I would like to give our audience some context about what we will be discussing today. So I was wondering if you could share with us um, the history that causes and still causes conflict in Burundi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to invite me. And thank you for my brothers and sisters, Syrian refugees who prepare food. And thank you, my sister, Opsi, uh, Yes, who invited me. So you have already seen um, the conflict in Burundi. 
But I must tell you, there is a big mistake uh, when they think that it's ethnic conflict. When we read in dictionary the difference, the meaning of uh, ethnic, it means you don't speak the same language, you don't live its tribes, but Burundi, Hutu and Tutsi, we speak the same language. We live in the same villages. I don't understand when even the missionaries or the colonialists, Belgian, separate and said uh, Hutu and Tutsi are different ethnic group. Because we speak the, the same language, of course, sometimes you can see a little difference, but you can also um, be confused. And Burundi was a kingdom for a long time, until 1966. And we have never uh, have those conflict, they say, uh, ethnic conflict. You must know, after independence, we began to have conflict. Why? Of course, I must accept. I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to say it's because Belgian colonialists. It's because of uh, bad governance. We have bad leaders because during the kingdom, the, with the king, we have never uh, had those problems between ethnic groups. But when colonialists uh, were there, they began to show that uh, Tutsi people are most, uh, uh, yes, better, they are beautiful, they don't come in the same origin, you know, if we see in the world who came, we, everybody migrant came in America or they pass from a country to another. And then Tutsi were um, in a scholarship. They give them a part they can become in administration, yes. And the Hutu, they are, uh, uh, they say they are, uh, um, how to say, very strong. Then for agronomists, and uh, you see, in the head of Burundian, the Tutsi began to think we can then become leaders, and Hutu will yes obey. But the Hutu after, the Hutu also said, why? It's our country. Then the conflict is because of social injustice. It's not because of the difference, because we have the same religion. We are, most of uh, Burundian are Christian. Then we go together in the same schools. We go together in the same church. It's bad governance. It's uh, because of um, bad leaders. It's not because of ethnic group. They use this ethnic group, but it's not the root of the conflict. It's not ethnic. So with all of the discouraging things going around you, what guides your work and how do you keep going on even when things go wrong? Of course, I am not an angel. Sometimes, <laughs> you see, I am a normal <laughs> mother. But um, I, I, I was lucky to have an extraordinary mom. My mom, I lost my father when I was only five years old. But my mom was so uh, extraordinary. She was only 24 years old, but she stood up. She gave me opportunity to go to school, and she taught me that there is no, no fatality in our life, that I am not orphans, 
that my father is always there and give me many valu moral values, compassion, dignity, uh, and also tolerance and all solidarity. And because of this, I was raised with those moral values of compassion and also to never give up. And she showed me that the life is a feast. Always we were dancing at home. Then I, I, even I suffer, even there are, you have seen, they killed my family also. Who too came in my village? I didn't uh, uh, tell uh, that in my in video because the most important things, it's not what they have done against me. It's what we can do. And we must stand up. We have, we are amazing. You, you forget, I must tell you, you young people, we are amazing. We are, uh, we are created on the picture of God. We are little God. If we want to stand up, we will change the world. Don't be afraid. We, because if we want, we are the change. We can, you young people, we are, you are our richness. If you want, we will change. I am not discouraged. They can destroy infrastructures. They can take the money, it's only papers from the bank, but they will never reach our treasure. That is love. Nobody can stop the love. Your faith is astounding, I just have to say, and an inspiration as well. Can you share a little bit about the story of your faith and how it is connected or brought you into the works that you have done uh, with all of these children? Um, for, for me, you know, I welcome all the children, Hutu, Tutsi, Congolese, Rwandese, and also Muslim, uh, uh, Protestant, Catholic. But uh, something we forget. God didn't create religion. It's we, because he gave me one love. We are one family. And it's a... Uh, when you believe really that you are a child of God, when you believe that your everybody is respected, is uh, created on the picture of God, that the life is sacred, that you can't touch to your sister and kill him, kill her, or your brother, or your child. When you believe that somebody who is great is with you. And I am Christian, I can give you the only uh, strength I got from my faith. It's, uh, sorry for those who don't believe like me, on the cross, always when I want to revenge, when I have hated, because they killed my family. I, I believe, I remember that on the cross, Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And promise us that he will be with us until the end of the world. Then when, for example, I lost my country, my, all the money, my children. I remember now he will be with me to, to stand up. Then, thanks to my faith, imagine if I, I lost 60% of my family, my aunt, my uncles, and after, when I want to refuse this ethnic violence, I, pro I, I tried to hide 72 Hutu 
in the bishop house, even my brothers with the blood, the tutti, came and humiliated me, tired, tired me, and they killed my friend, my neighbor, 72 in front of me. If I was not a, a Christian, if I don't, I, I don't believe that there is a reason to continue to believe. I must suicide myself because I lost everything. I, I was humiliated, but I cried. I went in chapel and I said, oh God, it's a lie. My mom lied to me. You are not a love. Why? Why? And when I was crying, uh, and want to suicide me, immediately in the chapel, sacristy, my children, my seven adoptive children, the first adoptive child, <coughs> called me, Mom, we, we are there. They didn't kill us. And then it was the answer. Then my faith. They can beat me. They can, um, how to say, try to kill me. But I will never give up. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about, um, about your faith um, and religion. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the role of religion um, in society. Um, religion can now be used to make a difference in society for the better, like you are doing. And it's also being used by some to justify violence. Um, how do you see the role of religion as being an agent of change to bring about peaceful solutions in the world? In my life, if I see those who had understood what is the meaning of religion? The good examples I have seen in, the, in my personal life, those who believe really, they had changed the world. Look, I can begin for even Dalai Lama, even Mother Teresa, even um, Martin Luther King, even those who believe you can see the impact in the society. Those who had really choose the side of the God because they believe that we are one human family. The region can change the world in a better uh, way. But those who think that those, since if you read or the Quran, or the Bible, or Torah, you will see that those who believe really in God, but you can use religion to have the power. And the big mistake in the world, when people use their religion to oppress the others, to discriminate the others, this is not a religion. This is another I, I, the ideology, mm -hmm. or in a politic way to maintain the brothers and sisters in a bad situation for social injustice. And this, this is not religion for me. This is another ideology. It's not religion. I believe in that. I, be, I see in our world, when people had used their religion to oppress the other, they create war. And it's a, we have one commandment. I am a Christian. It's a love each other. We have never seen kill each other for, for me. It's a, a, a big mistake. And God will ask, when we will die? I remember, they will not 
ask us about our religion? <laughs> no. They will ask us. I was a refugee. I was in the hospital. I was in a prison. I was in the street. I was ill. They will not ask us, have you, I can give you one joke. Yes. <laughs> I was uh, with uh, my friend who was uh, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish. Eh? And then uh, uh, one priest to told us that uh, a Jewish died. He didn't uh, believe in God. But suddenly, uh, St. Peter welcomed him. And then he was surprised. He said, and St. Peter showed him paradise. There, there there are Muslims. There there are also um, artists. Uh, there there are a former prostitutes. There there are philosophers. And then he saw a big hall and listened to psalms. And the Jewish asked St. Paul, uh, St. Peter, and there behind the wall, what is it? They are, they are Catholic because they think they are alone in a paradise. <laughs> yes, I am Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and this is what sometimes we we think, yes, you see the other. This is so stupid things. Stand up. We have one religion, love. Oh, my God. I don't even have words to say now. Um, but you just mentioned about um, your experience as a refugee in Rwanda. What have you learned most from that experience, especially walking along other refugees? So... I I come, I hide. You see, when you are a refugee, you have no identity sometimes. You you recognize when you you arrive on immigration, the police, you know that you must show your passport. And we refugees we have no passport. We have its travel document. And sometimes the police, for example, here in the USA, they ask, what is it? And what is written? It's so shocked for somebody because I didn't realize before I, because I walk long time with refugees, they recognize even me internationally. They give me um, Nansen Award for refugee because I helped so much many refugees before I became myself refugee. But it's right written. This is travel document. It's valid for all countries except Burundi. You imagine, you, you are there, they give you, and they s this remember you that you can't. You can't go to your mom because a country is a mom. And then, to realize why I stood up, when I realized that I lost my country. I lost. During 30 years, I was trying to fight for dignity, social justice, and to gather all the children to create a new generation who will be able to break this cycle of violence. And one day, I see that I must flee. After I was in Luxembourg, because you see, it's Luxembourg who give me a protection. I said to the queen of Luxembourg, I would like not to stay here. I want again not to, get to return 
with my people, Burundian, even I am citizen of the world, even I, I, I know, but God give me a country. Then I want to go and resist and work with Burundian to create hope, to restore the life, and to create, now I create a, a, a community center called Oasis of Peace to dream how to return without violence, to, e to educate those young people to return in the university. I send them more than 300 young people in the university and to give hope because we are builders of hope. We, we, everybody, it's why I will fight. I will never keep silence when they are killing people because we have a mother, I have a country, nobody can stop me to return in my motherland. It's why I have no, of course, professor said this anger, we must have this anger. When you are sitting there without anger, when they killed brothers and sisters, then you are like in a cemetery. We must stand up when they kill somebody, even in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in USA. A mother, for now I want to tell to the mothers who are here, you have a su sublime vocation when they kill a child somewhere. Every mom must stand up and say, don't kill my child. And when they kill a father, you say, no, we don't want to orphan. It's why I, I am in a refugee camp helping those refugee uh, people to stand up, to be a little candle in the middle of darkness. This is we can be able to be a little candle in the middle of darkness. Thank you. You've talked about your status as a refugee, which means you can't return back to Burundi, which I can't even imagine how hard that must be. Um, I was wondering with that, um, what is the status of Maison Shalom now? Um, and how are you navigating all of the changes? Um, some leaders, when I am thinking what Nguruziza, what our, I can tell the president of Burundi, because if you are president, you can't kill your own people. How I had to build a big hospital, you have seen it. It was for the population. It was not for me. I send children, I build uh, a bank, I build, but today they close everything. Imagine, because I was thinking that they will, even they don't want me because I try to denounce. I, I try to denounce to say, you can't kill people. But he closed. Why he closed uh, the hospital? He's killing his own people. He closed the schools I have uh, built. I, uh, he closed everything. He took all the money from the bank. But it's not my money. Because for me, I can just even stay in Luxembourg. Because what I have done, it was for humanity. It was for the people of Burundi, not for me. I don't get money from the hospital or from the, this bank. It was microfinance to help mothers, to help poor people. And the school, the, it was for the orphans, for child soldiers, former child soldiers, for street children. And then I can't even now I am a Christian, of course, but I, I have a saint, how to say, in Saint Colère, how to s call it. Mm. Saint Colère. Mad rage. 
really angry. Yes, a holy rage. How a leader can oppress his own people. I I pray for him. I think he's possessed. I really it's why when I began in TV, they ask me, what do you think about your president? I forget as a mom. I said, he's possessed. And then after they try to kill me. Okay, if they kill me, they will never kill the message. They can't kill all those what you have seen. Then I suffer so much. But this suffering is also purification. purification? Huh? Yes, yeah. because I can see that what we are building, we must build perhaps the, uh, the soul and raise people for dignity. And I hope that one day God will change his, his heart because I can't understand how he closed everything. And I lost all those, even money. But you see me, I am not so de depressed. It's just, no, no. He's, he's the, the president of Burundi. He must suffer so much. You must pray for him. <laughs> How can I? Yes, I pray for him. And uh, I forget, one day they ask me what they think. My criminal brother stopped to kill. And it's what I said. Front, we were two. I went to see him. I didn't go in the street. I didn't uh, um, have to say, be protesting for his third mandate. No. I protest. I went to meet him. I said, listen. You give me two awards. You give you call me national mother, but I can't accept to be a mother for a criminal son. If you don't stop to kill my bro my brothers, my sisters, my sons, a daughter, then I will protest. And he looked to me and said, "God bless you." Then I had understood that they will try to kill me. But for me, what is important? I don't come here to say about that, but to build the hope for a better world. And we, I am not a dreamer like the song Imagine uh, from John Len Lennon. We can dream this world a better world. We are able to be the change. And I will change that. Until I die, I will never give up. You are young. Come back in Rwanda. We can rebuild. We are twins, Rwanda and Burundi. And you have seen what happened in Rwanda, in Burundi, now in the east of Congo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's been this disposition that you've had to continue serving humanity in the face of crisis, after trauma, and in the face of violence that you've earned these names, Angel of Africa, <laughs> and other saintly titles. So maybe a fun question. In 100 years from now, you are canonized as a saint. <laughs> y yes. Ready? <laughs> are you ready for this? <laughs> What would you like to be the patron saint of? <laughs> no. I prefer when they say the crazy mom of Burundi. Yes. I am not a saint. No. I am not a ninja. No. I am just this crazy craziness of love. And then the better title. It's the crazy woman. The crazy woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and if you follow this craziness, the world will change. Don't be afraid to be crazy. Mm. Don't be afraid. You promised me to be crazy after this conference? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Make yes. 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 <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
Uh, so this is the part of the program where you get to ask questions. So if we have some folks in the audience uh, that would have some questions. Oh, awesome. Thank you very much, ma'am. My name is Wamwara John. I'm Kenyan. And uh, uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, uh, things you continue to do for our continent. And, and it gives us hope, that and, and uh, both in East Africa and in, uh, in Africa. Uh, m my question is, what's, uh, do you see a trend in East Africa? For example, we have Nkrunziza uh, who said no to term limits, and uh, then now the President Yoweri uh, Museveni is 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 uh, trying to push uh, remove age limit, and uh, of course uh, Rwanda has uh, succeeded to remove term limits, and Kenya is dangerously headed there as well. Uh, do you see uh, a trend in this part of Africa? And, and yes, I promise to be crazy even as I think of my country. Thank you. Oh, but Africa is a blessed. Even everywhere when you see they write Africa is lost. I don't believe because look, so many young people I see. Africa have many young people who refused now what the adults began to do. I see this hope because many young uh, uh, African people, now they protest. Now they open and they want to make the chance. I see I am with the young people and I believe that they will stand up. Perhaps today our leaders, even they are old, they have money, they have weapon. But the weapon, the most important weapon we can offer to our young is education. Now we have good educated young people. And they will not allow that. I, I am sure there is a hope. There is a hope. Don't be afraid. There is a hope because we have many young people who stand up for their countries. And you, our friend from West countries, and so don't be discouraged to see what happened in Africa. No. There is the light behind all those. Okay, le, le, derrière ces gros nuages, il y a le soleil qui lit. Large waves. Oh, behind the large waves, the sun is shining. Th thank you. Uh, my name is actually Arme Iranghunda. I'm from Burundi, Musaga, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, district that was affected by uh, the illegal third term of President Nkuruziza. So I go to Mohas College, uh, double majoring in economics and mathematics. Uh, I'm so glad to be here. I actually had my class ending at 12. <laughs> so I talked to my professor, and she was like, yeah, you can go. So. <laughs> Uh, I always, I haven't uh, had a chance to meet you in Burundi, but when you came here, I was so glad to come here to see you. And uh, I believe that if we had many people who are like you, our country was going to be a better country because uh, I think that we have uh, from maybe uh, 62 after our independence, we have so many crimes that were committed and they have never served the justice. So till right now, we are still facing those t kind of problems, but if we can have people like you, if young people can come together and uh, 
no matter what their ethnic differences, I believe that our country can become a better country. And I believe that in my generation, there will be a change. There will be a change. And uh, you know, I, I just came here to support you. I just came here to, to, see, to say that uh, there are people who see you as a mother. There are people who believe in your dreams. There are people who think that if we had maybe one person per a district who think like you, uh, the whole Burundi uh, was going to change for, for the better. Thank you so much for being who you are. Yeah. Thank you. Be the one in the one district. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ahme. What do you think is the most important way to make a change in the world? What's the most effective way to do it? Of course. Even I am a dreamer, I am a realist. Uh, we, we can wish that our world can become a paradise. But the only way that this world can be better it's to be against discrimination, to be against social injustice. Because when I, I travel often, and sometimes I am shocked when they say that there is nothing, they, some are dying uh, because of they are hungry. But when I am in the hotel, I see that some are dying because they eat too much. <laughs> and I am surprised that in our world, there are so many richness, but they don't want to share. They prefer to throw that in the ocean to maintain the economic way. And then they forget that we are one human family just to remember that we are one human family can change the world. <laughs> yeah. you, you agree? <laughs> or I am a crazy? <laughs> yes. There are so much money, but they, sp they spend money in stupid things. Yes. They will be tired, you, you know. Some friend said to me, call me, oh my God, I'm so tired. And they said, because yes, I was in the holidays in, in uh, Barcelona, after I went in uh, Il Canary, and after I now I want to go in Bulgari, and then I am very tired. I said, <laughs> okay, if you are very tired, give me this money. I can distribute in the refugee camp. <laughs> Don't call me that uh, you are so tired because or the, the other will, uh, will be tired and they cried but because they have a green hair there and then they will spend money to become so young. Take this, take the math, take the noise, take the eyes, take the this, take this. And they spend money like that. I want to say, please give me a, little, a small amount of this money. You want the, uh, the, yes, the math became this. Go in Africa, they have this, and they will <laughs> give you. Yes, you see, look how we are so stupid. Because, yes, we want. We are never be uh, uh, come on, uh, uh, very uh, agree, agree what we are. We African, we want to become white, and then we spend so much creams to become white and to put hair like that, and then and this money we can help. And you, you want to become uh, uh, brown? You are there on the sun, and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. this is how how we can stop slowly when we are in our bathroom and say, this I stop and this I send this. We can create a paradise every day. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah?
but I am crazy. <laughs> yes. Thank you. My name is Bryn Champney, um, and I just returned from Burundi, so I'm really happy to, s to see you here and see you speaking on campus, especially as our keynote speaker, mm -hmm. and to see Burundi recognized in this way. And I'm wondering um, what you can say to young people in Burundi who um, cannot directly speak out against the president from the situation where they are when they know very much that they and their families are at risk for doing so. How can this generation of young people in Burundi make a change um, as their lives are threatened for doing so? The only way I said those young, if they can have opportunity to go to school, then things will change. If all those young people who are used as militia, if they can have opportunity not to take weapon but to take a pen and uh, go to school, then Burundi will become a paradise. The only way for the change is education. Then I dream for that. It's why when I began even Maison Shalom, the first things I build schools. Because with when you build schools, when you allow for somebody to go to school, then you change. And it's the only way. All those militia who follow Nkurunziza, it's because they, are they have no, no other is issue. If they can go to school, then they will not take a weapon and defend a president who will never recognize them. Because they are dying also. They, after that, they kill them. They don't respect them. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. We, are, we have been truly blessed and truly, uh, we've not only eaten some fine food, <laughs> but we've been uh, fed uh, spiritually and mentally and emotionally today, and I think uh, we're going to leave full today. And uh, we are so grateful and so thankful that you've come and shared your wisdom and your experiences with us and, uh, and, and motivated us and encouraged each and every person in this room to do what they can do in order to make the world a better place. Oftentimes we romanticize folks that do things and we read about them in books and we put it back on our bookshelves and we say, well, I wish I could. Well, today we have a living example of someone who did and they did it based upon their own sphere of influence, what they could do in their own local community and created a ripple effect that is now impacting the whole world. So we just thank you so, so very much and we could not be more ecstatic and more fortunate to be here today with you. And thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And everyone, I hope, leaves today a little bit more encouraged to make the world a better place. We have a small token of appreciation to let you know how much we truly appreciate you as well. And so, without any further, oh, oh, oh. Yes. I was here. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I want to invite young people uh, from this university, if they can come, I talk with uh, your professor, to come to our uh, community center because there are so many things. You can teach also English to my young people and also you, you are welcome. We have a place. You can enjoy with other young. Don't hesitate to come. Yeah, you are welcome. Yeah. Okay, so this concludes, in some ways, the 21 Days of Peace. 
as a program, but we know that it's a lifelong journey. So we hope today that you continue to be a peacemaker and build love and build hope in others. And so we can aspire to be like Maggie. So turn to your neighbor and say, you can be like Maggie too. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. <laughs>